Stephen has been a delight to um, to dialogue with for all of these years. And Stephen, one of the things that I love about you is your exuberance and enthusiasm and uh, joie de vivre and, um, <clears throat> and your way of giving examples of things. They're always very lively and, and wonderful. And um, Stephen has been uh, uh, building continually his uh, institute in Brazil, ACT, right? Such a nice name. And um, has recently been doing other international work like in, in Egypt and very exciting, exciting work. And the thing that I most want to emphasize is that Stephen has just become a coordinator uh, for the the Institute. And so I think this is one of your first presentations as a coordinator. And, it is, uh, the very first. Really congratulate you after many years of, of uh, building your work. And um, <clears throat> so I think I'll let you finish introducing yourself, Stephen. And uh, thank you, everybody for welcoming Stephen with me. Well, it's a pleasure looking at everybody, and connecting. Um, I did some thinking, how would I introduce myself? And I decided to say that I'm, I'm here with you because uh, I assume like all of you were on a journey. Um, I started my journey 58 years ago when I decided to study psychoanalysis, uh, it wasn't a difficult decision because that's all there was. It was Freudian analysis and that was about it. Um, and <clears throat> I was lucky enough, not realizing being a very young student and practitioner um, to study with the people that Freud had analyzed and trained. And I was with that for over 15 years. But in the process, I began to realize that in facilitating a client to move forward, it required my growth in moving forward. And something was missing in the classical analytic frame. Um, and because I was um, always curious and exuberant, I, anything new that came along, I began to explore and study. And I was very lucky not, not to even know that the people I was studying with the founders. So I moved into Gestalt therapy with uh, Laura Pearls. I, I worked with Marino for a number of years in psychodrama. The body therapies came into being with uh, Paracas and other people. And uh, eventually um, Francine Shapiro and working with trauma because, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, what we knew about trauma was really unproductive. And uh, so I immersed myself in all of that. And I spent 28 years with Betty Alice Erickson as my friend, as a co-teacher, and, <clears throat> and we supervised each other. She knew more about Erickson's work than I did, and I knew more about trauma than she did. So we made a good team. And and uh, as I continued, what I found with the work of Carl Rogers and then with Erickson and then Eugene Genlin, I think I found what was missing, uh, which was process. And that in all the other forms of therapy, I was taught really to be <clears throat> responding to the person, but not in the system with the person, not connected to the process of the change that was taking place within me and the change that could take place in the client because I could become a catalyst for their positive change and vice versa, that you have to become that in the interaction. And, and of course, then through Lynn, the reintroduction to relational psychoanalysis because I had left the classical. <laughs> and uh, I did work for a number of years with Esther Menneker, not realizing that she was in the beginning of, the, of all of that. And the word relational is so meaningful to me. 
um, because um, I have found with focusing um, that it's all right to be me. Uh, yes, I've had all that analysis about all the things in my past that prevented me from being me, et cetera, et cetera, but that doesn't change very much. What, what changes is when, when you can go into that inner awareness, when you can, can begin to find the voice of your implicit inside of you. And I have found that as I found the voice of my implicit, which gave me a lot of surprising experiential information, I felt it and the felt sense, which could lead to the felt meaning, which continued to open my life, uh, that then I had a way of transmitting that and helping clients to use focusing. Uh, you know, Milton Erickson's work is phenomenal, but one thing that he never did and Betty never did is they never were able to, were really concerned with explaining how they did what they did. Um, and when I first, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Lynn, but when, when I first did my training and then when I reconnected to you, I realized uh, <clears throat> that Jenlin really has a way of letting you feel the process. And then really that's the way to help a client understand what this could mean for them in their life by experiencing it. So I initially started out to use focusing to help me explain Erickson's work and discovered that it was a very nice marriage in terms of, because when I say focus, I mean the focused state of attention. Focusing is an inward focusing state of attention. And that was Erickson's early definition. So um, as I found that it was all right to be me, then that was part of the transaction I could have with my clients. And it would be all right for us to be who we were with each other. And um, I have a little mantra that I'll share with you that made a big change in my life. Uh, I'm not broken. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing to fix. There's nothing I have to change. And I can be much, much more. So I do feel that part of my journey was discovering again and again and again that regardless of what I thought I was doing, I was approaching my clients as if they needed to be fixed, as if they were broken, as if something had to be changed. I had to be responsible for the change, which never really helps a person to change because they need to access their own innate abilities. And um, it led me to a much fuller professional and personal life, much more relaxed in the work I do. Um, because I really feel that there were three things that are so important. One is to have the ability to focus. We live in a time when that's an ability we have to reestablish because we spend most of our time focused on not being who we are, doing selfies and on Facebook. And it also seems to me curiosity. Uh, I would say one of the, for me, one of the major resistances to any change is when a person isn't curious, it's really hard for them to even imagine anything could be different. And then what I call um, innate confidence. You know, I spent a lot of years, and I don't know, but I imagine some of you still struggle with this. I do from time to time. Am I enough? Do I have self-confidence? But the more I entered into the process of focusing and that we are process, we are molecules in motion, interacting and changing each other. The more I moved into that, the more I realized if I trust the innate um, process, if I have confidence in the focusing, then all those distracting voices, could I say it right? What should I do? How should I? It all fades away because you just become the in one with the process because you trust your intentions and the process will lead you where it leads you. So 
I guess that's my way of introducing myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to be brought into your process that way, Stephen, and yeah, yeah. going along with you in that development. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's been nice me going along with me too, <laughs> instead of analyzing it. Because there's a big difference analyzing how you're proceeding in your life and being in life and, and learning how to accommodate and cope with, and that you have, I have, you have the inner ability. It's all there. It's waiting. You have to activate it. And that's the other thing I feel so strongly about focusing in the relationship between yourself and the relationship from yourself to the client in the implicit level you have activate what's an innate process and waiting for us to use and has always been there. And, and that's the magic. Mm -hmm. I, so I a, when you use the word uh, focusing, yeah. you know, it, it, it can mean so many things and, and all related, you know, there's the practice of focusing, there's the mm -hmm. reference to making the implicit explicit this you know but I, i'm just wondering if you could give us how how you are using the word um that's a tough question <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe uh, we should save it till later and then no 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 i'll, I'll give it a shot because it, because it's what a what came up instantly is what i trust the the voice in me immediately said Fostering a sense of inner awareness and dialogue mm. within the person mm. is, is focusing. Because yeah. without going in inner, without awareness, without that dialogue, and it's just information so that they hear it without condemning themselves or bringing in the distractions and the critical voice, but just bringing them into a climate, providing a climate, focusing mm. politeness, a climate. And within that climate, the person can begin to reconnect to having inner awareness and an inner dialogue, which leads them into um, the felt sense and the felt meaning. And, and, and I feel it leads them into, I, I also, in my training, became an interfaith minister with a uh, focus on Buddhism, and Buddhism is very the same as focusing <clears throat> in terms of you have to develop the ability to stay focused and then pursue and accept that inner dialogue, and it it has all the information you need for becoming who you were meant to become. Thank you, thank you. And, and I'm 